before we start, I would like also to remind you that the Getty Center and the Getty Villa are sitting on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Gabrielino Tongwa, Tatavian, and Chumash peoples. I acknowledge our presence on this land and pay respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of these groups, past, present, and emerging. We convene here today to have a conversation on Italian 17th century painter Artemisia Gentileschi with four eminent scholars. Uh, you will see the fourth very soon. Uh, an event uh, that is co-presented with the Italian Cultural Institute here in Los Angeles. In the last 20 years or so, Artemisia Gentileschi became really a popular figure protagonist of movies, novels, many exhibitions. You see some examples here on screen. But at the beginning of the 20th century, she was almost a forgotten name in the history of Italian painting. Although there are, there were ancient biographies and, you know, uh, we knew the existence of Artemisia Gentileschi, uh, there were 17th and 18th century biographies of her. She was almost forgotten to art history. And it was thanks to uh, a young, at the time, Italian art historian who discussed his thesis on the Italian painter Caravaggio in 1912 that she sort of started to reemerge from uh, the, um, the shadows of the past. And it's Roberto Longhi that in 1916 published an article, Artemisia, uh, cioè Gentileschi, padre e figlia, Gentileschi, father and daughter. And it's, there, it's from there that, in some way, the reconstruction of Artemisia's artistic biography and her output uh, began. In 1947, uh, Roberto Longhi's wife, the writer Anna Banti, published a novel on Artemisia that you see here on screen. And it was her that attracted the attention, perhaps on the most infamous episode of Artemisia's life, her rape by one of her father's collaborators, uh, the painter Agostino Tassi, when she was uh, 17 years old, and the subsequent trial. The papers of the trial were already published in the 19th century, but they, have, they had not attracted much attention. And it was really uh, thanks to the novel by Anna Banti, which was very well documented, that this episode was, you know, became in some way one of the focuses of the, on the, of the reconstruction of Artemisia's biography. And then later on, in 1976, uh, an important exhibition was organized here in Los Angeles by uh, two um, famed art historians. One of them is Linda Nochlin, who a few years ago published an important book, an important article on why there were so few women artists in the early modern period, basically before the French Revolution and pointing out you know, the cultural and social barriers that prevented women to practice art before, you know, in the period of the so-called Ancien Regime, before the French Revolution. This seminal exhibition was followed by many, uh, by a, a lot of research and studies on Artemisia. Today, publication on her are innumerable and include especially two important monographs, which in some way constitutes the basis of our knowledge of Artemisia. One monograph by feminist art historian Mary Garrard, published in 1989, Artemisia Gentileschi, the image of the female hero in Italian Baroque art, and the other monograph by Raymond Ward Bissell, published 10 years later in 1999, Artemisia Gentileschi and the Authority of Art. And I would like to remind you also that the very first monographic exhibition, so the very first exhibition devoted entirely to Artemisia Gentileschi, was presented in 1991 at the Casa Buonarroti in Florence and was then followed by many other exhibitions. We'll, we'll talk a little bit later about another important exhibition uh, on her. Um, 
Before we really start to talk with our panelists of today, I would like to remind you a few essential facts about Artemisia Gentileschi's life, just to frame a little bit uh, the conversation, so you have some a little bit chronological elements. She was born in Rome in 1593. Um, she lost her mother when she was 12 in 1605, and she was trained by her father, Orazio Gentileschi, who was also a painter. Basically, by 1610, she was an independent, very skilled painter, and she subsequently had a very successful career who brought her to many different Italian and non-Italian cities, especially to Florence, to Venice, to Naples, and also to London. She probably died in Naples during the 1656 plague, uh, we don't know this for sure, but the last document which mentions her alive dates from 1654, and her last signed painting uh, is from 1652. So basically we are here covering the first half of the 17th century with her life and career. As I was telling you, I'm here with four distinguished scholars who have written important contributions on Artemisia. Um, Sheila Barker in yellow, adjunct pro associate professor of art history at the University of Pennsylvania and director of, of Friends of the Medici Archive Project in Florence, is the author of a forthcoming monograph, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi, published by Getty Publication, and also she introduced this little book, uh, also published by the Getty, which contains early sources on the life and career of Artemisia. Jesse Locker, on my left, uh, professor of Italian Renaissance and Baroque Art at the School of Art and Design of the Portland State University, is the author of Artemisia Gentileschi, The Language of Painting, published in 2015 by Yale University Press. Judy Mann, here at my left, curator of European art to 1800 at St. Louis Art Museum, curated, was one of the organizers of the groundbreaking exhibition in 2001 and 2, Orazio and Artemisia Gentileschi, Father and Daughters Painters in Baroque Italy, which was presented in St. Louis, New York and Rome, and has this huge, wonderful catalog. The fourth speaker, last but not least, that is with us, and you will see her in a few moments, is Letizia Treves. She's tuning in from London, and she is the, where she is the James and Sara Sassoon curator of later Italian, Spanish, and French 17th century paintings at the National Gallery in London. In 2020, uh, during such a difficult year, she curated an important exhibition on Artemisia Gentileschi held at the National Gallery London, which was organized after the museum purchased a newly discovered self-portrait of Artemisia. And actually, I would like to start uh, with Letizia. Maybe we can see her in some way, I hope. I think so, yes. Letizia, hi, can you hear us? Hello, I can, I can, hello. Great, thank you for being with us. Um, uh, so my question is, uh, the first gallery of your exhibition at the National Gallery presented a spectacular array of self-portraits by Artemisia, among them the painting we are seeing here on screen, uh, picture that was recently acquired by the National Gallery and which is also a recent rediscovery. Self-portraiture and especially self-portraiture in disguise represented for Artemisia an important way of branding in some way and promoting herself. Can you tell us more about the painting that you acquired for the gallery and in general these pictures by Artemisia? 
Yes, of course. Thank you, Davide. It's a real pleasure to join you remotely. <laughs> um, as, as you said, in 2018, we were lucky enough to acquire the, the picture currently on the screen, the self-portrait as St. Catherine of Alexandria. And since then, I've been thinking a lot about Artemisia's representation of herself in her work. Um, because over half of Artemisia's known paintings have at one point or another uh, been identified as self-portraits or at least containing portraits of herself. And I think because Artemisia did use her own image occasionally in some of her pictures, um, and also she, she's an artist who's, who, whose life is very intertwined with her art, I think there is a temptation to see her, her features in almost every Susanna, Judith and Lucretia she ever painted. But actually, um, the true self-portraits uh, are actually quite few in number. And the acquisition of this picture was, as you said, the impetus for the exhibition that we had in London at the National Gallery in 2020, which um, tragically many people were not able to come to London to see because of the pandemic. Um, but this is in fact the second room of the exhibition, which you've just mentioned. And for me, this was absolutely one of the highlights to see our picture, for the very first time alongside other paintings by Artemisia, but also seeing three self-portraits hanging side by side uh, for the very first time. And then through the doorway on the right, I hung a portrait of Artemisia by the French painter Simon Vouet. And so this was really an opportunity for vis visitors to compare how Artemisia saw herself, but also how she was represented by others. And Artemisia's features are actually quite distinctive. This is the portrait by Vouet, uh, which was hanging through the doorway. Um, you can see in all these three objects, she has these quite bow lips, a sort of fleshy jowl. Um, she has quite a prominent hump on, on, on the bridge of her nose and then quite sort of well-defined eyebrows over these heavy lidded eyes. And in all the three works on the screen, you can see a, you know, a resemblance. And the engraving is in fact after a lost painted self-portrait by Artemisia. And I think what's really important in looking at Artemisia's paintings and, uh, and her work, you need to really make a distinction between, you know, what is a self-portrait in a very literal sense of recording her features, such as the picture on the left here today at Hartford, and a sort of self-fashioning, that's what I like to call it, where there is a very clear resemblance. Um, but, you know, as in the National Gallery port portrait, Artemisia assumes a role. You know, she, she assumes different roles and guises. Um, the picture on the left in Hartford is almost certainly the painting that's mentioned in a Medici inventory in 1638, where it's described as a portrait of Artemisia by her own hand in which she plays the lute. It was probably commissioned by the Medici and may record a real life event because we know that in 1615, a Signora Artemisia performed at the Medici court along with three other women dressed as a gypsy in what was called the Ballo delle Zingare, the dance of the gypsy women. And in this portrait, you know, this incredibly rich blue gown, the sash around her waist, the, the, the headscarf, the little kind of gold hoop earring, these feel to me very theatrical and she's clearly, you know, performing a role here. It's interesting also to note the Medici owned another self-portrait um, by Artemisia, where she, she took on the role of an Amazon warrior wearing a helmet and wielding a sword and a shield. It must have been a, a formidable portrait. And in both of those pictures, Artemisia was clearly presenting herself in different roles, rather like Rembrandt did in his tronies in, in, in Northern Europe. But in the National Gallery self-portrait on the right, um, here her features are much less specific. She's more idealized. You can see the characteristic hump on her nose has been sort of smoothed out. Her neck is elongated. Um, I mean, she is clearly recognizable in this picture, um, but, but you know, that there is an element of idealization. And these two pictures are very closely related, not just in, in pose and in the sort of half length format. But if I show you this, which is a graphic overlay of the pictures of the Hartford painting of the lute player over the National Gallery painting, you can see that Artemisia must have transposed the design or parts of the design from one canvas to the other, using a transfer method rather like tracing, 
Uh, and this is something she would have learned from her father, from Orazio Gentileschi. So the relationship between these two pictures is very close indeed. And the recent discovery of the self-portrait now in the National Gallery um, and the, the, the conservation treatment as a result, the technical imaging, these have all helped shed light on Artemisia's working practice. And not just in relation to the self-portrait as a loop player, but also to this picture, this picture of St. Catherine in Uffizi. Now this picture is sometimes, and I think wrongly in my view, been said to represent Artemisia herself. And X-rays have actually revealed that beneath that painting, there is a turban figure very like our picture. It's almost identical, in fact, to the National Gallery painting. And what this shows is that Artemisia was working on these three paintings uh, contemporaneously in the studio, transferring parts of her design from one to the other. Um, but unlike the, the picture on the left and right, which we know was almost certainly made for the Medici, we actually don't know the circumstances in which the National Gallery self-portrait was made. And I think this is a really important point in discussing Artemisia's work. We, we don't know who our picture was painted for. We don't know if it was Artemisia's idea to include herself as St. Catherine, or perhaps it, would, it was at a patron's request. And I think it's also very tempting to imagine that Artemisia might have identified with this particular martyr saint, with St. Catherine, having suffered herself the torture at the hands of men. But I think this sort of self-identification um, with her subject is, is a little far-fetched. And I think it really ignores the context in which the National Gallery painting was made. And also what we see today was not Artemisia's original intention. And we know this because imaging of our picture during conservation revealed that she was originally just a turban figure rather like a sibyl and it was only sub subsequently in a sort of second moment that she was given you know the halo the crown the martyr's palm and the wheel all these attributes that identify her as saint catherine so these pictures sort of evolve have a life of their own in the studio before they've even left the studio and this sort of transformation is also true of this little picture panel, which is another self-portrait, almost certainly the very first self-portrait we have, um, where she appears as a female martyr. And we were lucky enough to study this picture at the National Gallery before the exhibition and do x-rays and infrareds. And this also revealed that Artemisia um, really made significant changes to the blue turban, probably added that pink drapery and the little hand and the martyr's palm in a sort of second moment, almost like they were afterthoughts. So this picture was sort of born as a self-portrait and was later sort of transformed into a disguised self-portrait uh, as a saint. Um, it's not a coincidence, a coincidence that all these three self-portraits um, were painted whilst Artemisia was in Florence. And it was here in particular that there was a very long-standing tradition of artists sort of putting themselves in their pictures in these disguised self-portraits. And Artemisia was the first woman to gain membership to the Artists' Academy in Florence in 1616, but she wouldn't have been able to take part in life drawing classes. And I, I believe Sheila will be talking a little bit more about Artemisia's time in Florence in a moment. And Artemisia would really have had to rely on hiring models to pose for her, and this was very expensive. She later in life complains, she describes it as a spesa intollerabile di modelli, the unbearable expense of hiring models. And there's no doubt that painting herself from a mirrored reflection would have been a lot cheaper uh, and a much more convenient alternative. But practical considerations aside, I think it's important to mention that Artemisia knew the additional appeal a painting would have with her face in it. You know, it was an incredibly ingenious and a sort of marketing strategy and a very conscious act of self-promotion. She was able to disseminate her image through her art, rather like Rembrandt did in, in as I said before, in the Netherlands. And I just want to end on this, the allegory of painting, because this is often referred to as a self-portrait. And I think here Artemisia is exploiting the existing convention of a personification being represented by a woman, by a female figure. And here she intentionally conflates these two traditions of allegory and self-portraiture. And she does that also in this picture, the allegory of inclination some, some 20 years earlier. 
um, which incidentally in the sources is only ever referred to by its title as an allegory of inclination. But now generally scholars always refer to this picture as a self-portrait. Um, but in the picture on the left in the royal collection, you know, it would have been extremely difficult for Artemisia to paint herself at this angle, even with multiple mirrors. And also she was in her sort of mid forties by the time this picture was painted and, and the woman in the picture is clearly younger. So I, I really feel it can't be read as a literal self-portrait, but it is unquestionably self-referential. She, she places her initials, AGP, Artemisia Gentilexi Pinsit, straight underneath the painter's palette. Um, for us to see. And we're certainly meant to associate the author of this picture with her subject. There's no, there's no doubt of that. So although we don't know the circumstances that give rise to all the known self-portraits by Artemisia, we have to acknowledge that the decision to include herself may not always have originated with Artemisia herself. Um, but the fact that these works exist, especially on a relatively small scale, does imply that there was a ready market among collectors for these self-portraits and for these disguised uh, self-portraits. The recent discovery of this picture and everything we've learned about its relationship with the other self-portraits of the period really reminds us there's still so much we don't know uh, about Artemisia's artistic process. Um, and I think, you know, we have to acknowledge that there are plenty of paintings and including, of course, the self-portraits that are out there and have yet to be found. So I might stop there and, and pass over. Thank you. Thank you, Letizia. I think we'll come back to some of these oh. images later on with some questions. And uh, we, I would like to hear from Judy now. And Judy, in, in 2000, as I was saying before, in 2001 and two, you curated alongside with Keith Christiansen this memorable exhibition devoted to Orazio and to his daughter Artemisia. Um, I would like to ask you, in some way, which were the challenges of presenting these two figures to the general public at the time, and how much, uh, according to you, our image of Artemisia, for you also, has changed in the last 20 years, especially with this, with this pace of Paint new paintings reappearing uh, on the on the market and and being again available to to scholars and the public. Sure. So my introduction to Artemisia was really through this painting, which is in my own museum, the St. Louis Art Museum. It was a Danai uh, that was purchased in London uh, in 1986 as an Orazio Gentileschi. Uh, when I came uh, several years later to the museum, uh, it really became a issue for me to determine who painted this. Um, and there were very divided opinions. Um, some said it couldn't be Artemisia because she wouldn't use copper. No one knew that, and in fact, there was a copper painting by Artemisia. Um, and uh, some simply questioned it because it was a high quality picture. So by definition, it wasn't by Artemisia. There was a really very big bias against Artemisia. And so um, several years in uh, thinking about this, I realized the only way that we're going to address the authorship of this picture was to have an exhibition where we looked at both Artemisia and Orazio. And I began actually by looking at paintings by Orazio, um, which were easy to see. Um, no one questioned my coming to see them. Um, when I then, after with a NEH grant, started looking more seriously at Artemisia, it was a bit of a different story. Um, partly, there, there was a catalog resume on Orazio, that is, a, a catalog of all the paintings, or by one scholar's opinion, all the paintings. There was no such thing for Artemisia, there were several major publications. Um, and some of the key paintings that one would want to see were simply not generally available to see. Um, for example, 
the picture that already in, and we're talking the early 90s, um, picture, this picture, the Uffizi Judith Slaying Holofernes, was already the kind of quintessential signature picture for Artemisia, a um, survey of art history textbooks, those authors who decided to include women painters in their histories had already begun to rely on this image as the way to show Artemisia. This painting wasn't available to be seen at the Uffizi, it was in the Corridorio Vasariana, which was open by appointment, so it wasn't regularly available. Um, other uh, examples of paintings that were not in their, um, uh, on the walls of their galleries or museums. Um, in the case of this painting, one of three altarpieces uh, made by Artemisia for the cathedral at Pozzuoli, um, in trying to see these, they were held uh, at the Capitamonte Museum. Um, very difficult to see these, um, and I had a, an experience, probably one that um, Jesse and Sheila and probably Davide also has had, that um, I made an appointment. I was going to be uh, admitted into storage to see these. When I got to the uh, door uh, that uh, with the uh, uh, attendant assigned to me, I was told that actually the person who had charge of the key to this door was not available to me, and I would have to wait and so I ended up waiting several hours uh, when it became clear I think that I wasn't leaving until I saw these paintings and then the horror that um, not all of them were framed they were in a space with a, uh, a uh, dirt floor um, so the conditions under which they were held uh, were really shocking to me um, demonstrating that these were not uh, paintings that were highly regarded uh, by the um, museum. Um, certainly in attempting to identify and make hopefully new discoveries of works by either Arazzi or, Arazio or Artemisia, um, there was a clear bias against Artemisia with dealers. In fact, when I was um, doing this work and it was clear that I thought that our Danai was a work by Artemisia, not by Orazio, I was constantly asked the question, why in the world would I want to demote our picture by taking it out of Orazio's oeuvre and putting it into Artemisia's? And if for no other reason, I would reduce its value considerably by doing so. Um, so um, there was uh, a, a, a real uh, bias. Um, and the other um, uh, major thing was the uh, publication of Mary Garrett's uh, 1989 monograph, which is a very fine book and I have enormous respect for Mary. But she presented a particular image of Artemisia. Um, as a kind of fierce heroine uh, kind of uh, figure. And there was a resulting um, kind of dismissal or uh, bias against some of the non-heroic, non-female dominant uh, pictures. For example, I'm showing this uh, Suzanne and the Elders, which is still a somewhat controversial picture, but it is a really beautifully traditional image of Susanna who, when uh, uh, the elders uh, put pressure on her uh, to have sex with them, uh, she, according to the book of Daniel, turns to heaven and with tears in her eyes implores God's help, which is exactly what Artemisia has shown here, uh, clutching her, her kamicha or her, her sort of um, undergarment around her um, in this very uh, futile and yet sensitive uh, image. To me, this is um, absolutely the way Artemisia thinks. But because it is so traditional and biblical in its interpretation, um, a lot of people felt that this wasn't really the kind of painting one wanted to have in the exhibition. The same holds true of the Annunciation, uh, seen as simply a traditional image of the Annunciation. In the course of the show, the um, Annunciation was cleaned, um, making it more apparent, not it wasn't, it was apparent before, making it more apparent that you have this angel arrayed in this heavenly splendor who kneels down before this very uh, humble and simple woman. It, uh, again, to me, it's very much Artemisia's thinking. It, it is not necessarily standard, but because it was that kind of uh, religious painting, not a, a strong uh, femme forte, um, it wasn't uh, highly regarded. 
or this painting that was completely ignored. Um, I mentioned to you that the one of the rationales for dismissing the uh, Danai as being painted by Artemisia because it couldn't, uh, she didn't use copper. This painting was known at the time, but but just so ignored because it is. It it is certainly not my favorite Artemisia um, for many reasons, but it's signed, and I have absolutely no doubt that this is by her. It's done for a very specific reason for a specific patron. Um, she was trying to, I'm showing you a, a copper painting by Guido Reni that Artemisia knew, and I'm doing a little work now on her copper paintings. She might have even owned a copy of this. It was very popular, and there are numerous versions of it. Um, but she was uh, making a painting for a, um, a hopeful patron uh, by flattering his ego to compare him to the original owner of this small copper painting, Scipione Borghese. So again, it's a very strategic and clever, uh, yes, very traditional, not really the most uh, 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 beautiful of her paintings, but uh, nonetheless, it is her thinking and the way she worked. Um, one other bias that came out of, I think, Garrett's book was that Artemisia didn't paint men. <laughs> um, I got told that a lot. Again, I was talking to dealers, hoping to uh, get them on the trail to find new Artemisias, new Orazios, and um, you know this, um, that, and looking particularly for non-female uh, protagonist pictures. Um, and interestingly enough, we were working with the Met. Um, the picture you're seeing on the screen had been at the Met, um, but was deaccessioned, not uh, being attributed to Artemisia at the time with an unknown authorship, uh, was deaccessioned in 1979. And at the time we were preparing the exhibition, uh, was lost, so we were unable to track it down. It has since obviously reappeared. Um, and it's quite a wonderful painting and uh, very much a, a figure of a man. It made its way back made its way back to Italy, yes. which is kind of amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. No, it is. And, and you know, it, it's a wonderful picture. Um, one thing that helped me enormously in, in uh, working on the show, though, was the uh, exhibition already referred to in Florence at Casa Buonarroti uh, by Roberto Contini and Gianni Papi who put on a, a show that focused on Artemisia in Florence, although was uh, much broader than that. And even though the 1976 show of women artists had featured this important painting at Palmersfelden, the uh, Susanna and the Elders, this is a signed picture by Artemisia of 1610. So she is 17 years old and she's creating the picture. I think, no question about it, her father assisted her. I think a lot was at stake when this painting was made. But it was this painting in that show that um, at least in my circle and acquaintances, this was the picture that really convinced them that Artemisia Genelewski was an artist worth spending time thinking about and researching. And in fact, internally in my own institution, it was this picture that convinced our director that this uh, was a, a project uh, really that, that should be done. So um, I think it was the 91 show that kind of made this uh, painting a kind of well-known um, iconic work. And it's, uh, I mean, as long as I've been working on Artemisia, it, this painting gets better and better. There's just no question about it. It's a fabulous work of art. Um, and then since then, we've had a lot of milestones. As Davide mentioned, there have been um, new discoveries. Um, Artemisia Genelewski scholars are, on the whole, not a bunch of sheep. <laughs> uh, there are wide differences of opinion, and we're not always of the same mind. The, the, some of the paintings I've discussed here today, um, there are, are major scholars who don't uh, quite agree. Uh, but the painting you're seeing now, this fabulous um, uh, uh, penitent Magdalene that was sold in Paris in 2014, uh, was a picture that miraculously um, got almost universal acceptance, which was wonderful. But I'm showing it to you because it marked another important milestone in the development of Artemisia Genelewski, and that's it was the first painting at auction to uh, uh, sell for in excess of a million dollars. 
Um, and uh, not that Artemisia is anywhere near her father in sales. She was paid less than he was when they were living, and her uh, work still commands uh, lesser prices. Here in the Getty, we're <laughs> um, at a place that has one of, well, the most expensive Orazio Gentileschi ever. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I think that is testament to, I mean, this is a fabulous painting, um, but also testament to the recognition, I think, that she's beyond just a painter of these women who cut off men's head with lots of blood. I mean, she's really a, a sensitive and a, a really original thinker. Um, so, uh, and then I'll end with this, which I took particular joy in. Um, it's a discovery close to the time of Letitia's show, only because I think it's a particularly interesting male figure uh, done by Artemisia, again, after being told time and time again Artemisia didn't do men or uh, one shouldn't care about Artemisia's men. And uh, to me, this wonderful image of David, um, it, it captures sort of the hubris of youth, I think. He's not really uh, contemplating his deed as much as just um, having done it, he's uh, rather proud of himself or that's how I see it. Um, so there's been um, a deepening and widening of Artemisia as a, 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 a painter, as an artist. I think the two people sitting next to me have uh, made major contributions in ensuring that that's happened. So um, I think we're in a very different world than the, we were back in um, 19... Uh, really, I... I pitched the show and, and we were on board with um, the Met in 1996 and back then I still had to defend doing a show. I didn't have to defend Orazio, but I had to defend including Artemisia. Right. Thank you, Judy. And yes, and sort of following this path and talking about deepening and widening perspective, knowledge, information. Um, so Sheila, your New book on Artemisia is soon to be published. We, this is really an advanced copy. It will be available from February. Um, but you obviously spent a lot of time exploring the Medici archives in Florence and other archives, especially in Florence where Artemisia, we know, spent a, sort of a very important, a crucial moment of her career just after he left Rome. And, and, and so it's a, it's a very important moment in her career where she painted some of, the, of her greatest pictures. And, and we really know that it was in Florence that she became la pittora, as in Italian, the paintress, uh, with her own reputation, with clients, and where also she made very important connections. Um, so I would like for you to tell us a little bit what you learned about her life, her family and friends, the intellectual and artistic circles that she frequented in Florence and that were so important to really establish her career and reputation. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and for the question about my archival research. Truly, archival research has given us a wealth of information about Artemisia's seven years in Florence, ruled by the Medici, from 1613 to 1620. A trove of documents of bailiff records from the merchant's court happens to tell us an awful lot about Artemisia. We learn that she had a very large line of credit and that she spent that money, that credit, on acquiring of an impressive wardrobe, a very luxurious wardrobe, befitting of a noble woman. And in fact, many of the items that are mentioned in these documents can be seen in her paintings. For example, the document I'm showing here mentions two brocade, silk brocade dresses of hers, one of which had real gold trim on it. Uh, some of the other records mention a red crimson velvet bed cover, which is featured in this painting. Uh, and nearly uh, half of them mention uh, very important jewelry that she owned. And in nearly all of her images of women, there are also uh, women's jewels. So if Artemisia owns the kinds of uh, 
items that we see featured on her heroines. When she walked around Florence, she resembled the, um, the celebrated women of her own paintings. And she also would have looked like a kind of Kardashian of her times. She was dressed to the nines um, and very, very considered to be very beautiful. But beyond giving her social cachet, this wardrobe that she wore also had, or this wardrobe that she acquired also had a very practical function uh, because the aesthetic that she was going for in her paintings involves a kind of optical realism. And in order to paint objects that looked real, she needed real objects before her eyes. She needed real objects and live models, as Letizia has pointed out. Another document that came from the Florentine archives and was discovered very recently is her marriage contract. Uh, this turned out to be a wonderful bounty of information and it answers the question I had before. How did Artemisia have this incredible line of credit? And why did she need credit? Well, the marriage document tells us that she had a very large dowry or wedding gift given to her by her own father. Uh, it was way beyond the typical amount given to the daughters of artisan families. She was given a thousand gold scudi. I checked that out. It's about three and a half kilos of gold. And on the market today, that much gold would be worth $200,000. But if you take that amount of money and you put it into a historical economy, $200,000 would have been worth 10 to 20 times more in terms of its buying power. Well, so she had a document saying that she would be a rich woman. Uh, the document also had an interesting stipulation. That money was not under the control of her husband as was normally the case, fiduciary control. Instead, this contract has a stipulation that Artemisia had controlling interest on how that money was to be spent and that it, was to be, it could be spent uh, for a business investment. And her clothes, I've just explained, are part of the business expense, um, as were other things. It did have another condition that made life very complicated for Artemisia. The money was not given to her all at once, and it was not given at the beginning. Half of it was to be doled out only after her second year of marriage, excuse me, her third year of marriage, and the rest of it was to be doled out only after her eighth year of marriage. So <laughs> we'll get into this a little bit more, uh, but it's a very, very revealing document. The reason why it's so interesting that this document, the marriage contract, put pressure on Artemisia to stay with her husband in order to get that money is because we now know, thanks to the publication of Francesco Solinas, that she had an adulterous affair. She was not completely happy in her marriage. Uh, a tr uh, number of letters have been discovered written by Artemisia to Francesco Maria Maringhi. And it's pretty fair to call them love letters. They were never meant to be seen by other eyes. They're very intimate, sometimes shockingly um, intimate in character. Francesco Maria Maringhi was a younger man, somewhat younger than Artemisia. Um, he was single at the time. And uh, I've uh, looked at, but I haven't published yet, his wills. And he was not wealthy. He was not, he was well, well to do, but he was certainly, uh, wasn't uh, an extremely wealthy person. So there must have been some personal dynamic there. Uh, but in any case, these letters uh, confirm what I've also seen in the judiciary documents, which is that Artemisia is living apart from her husband in order to have this affair. They confirm that she has a separate home, 
that she is financially autonomous, and that uh, she has employees who work for her, not her husband. All of that comes out of the court record. So with, within her, her 20s, she is already living a very independent life, financially and in terms of her social uh, movements. The letters also give us insight into her character. Uh, we all have many different sides to us, but these give us insight into her character as a lover. She's impetuous, demanding, haughty, uh, mercurial, uh, but we also see that she is driven. Uh, she doesn't talk about her children at all, but she talks about her artworks. She is co deeply committed to her art. From another manuscript source, we get a sense of the public facade that Artemisia was promoting while she lived in Florence. Uh, this manuscript is written by her earliest biographer when she was probably in her late, mid-late 20s in Florence. It's written by Cristofano Bronzini, who probably knew her uh, through the Medici court connections. And it's very interesting to consider how different the life she spoke about to people in Florence was from the life we know about from other documents. Uh, for one thing, she didn't want anyone to think that she had been trained by her father. She wanted people to believe that she had learned how to paint on her own, that she practiced painting mostly while living in a convent, which is completely made up, and that she could replicate perfectly the style of Caravaggio. Not her father, but Caravaggio. Another interesting aspect of this earlier biography is what it does not mention at all, the rape. That was not something that she wanted people to be aware of. And yet, even though she didn't want people to know about the rape trial, one would never use the word demure in order to describe Artemisia during her Florentine years. Uh, besides the adulterous affair that, affair that I mentioned earlier, which eventually became a matter of court gossip, uh, there are paintings like this one, uh, which uh, Letizia mentioned. We've got Artemisia's features, her facial features, on the body of a nude woman, and the drapery you see now was added after her death. It used to be much more nude than it is now. This painting was commissioned by um, Michelangelo, Michelangelo Bonarotti Jr. He was a playwright at the Medici court, and he, uh, we know from his notes, he dictated the subject of the image. He, he designed, uh, uh, ideated the, the subject. And it is an allegory, as Letizia pointed out. Um, Chris, uh, uh, Michelangelo Bonarotti Jr., as a playwright, involved Artemisia in his literary circle. He introduced her to other poets and playwrights, composers, perhaps including Francesca Caccini, uh, the first female opera writer, according to Florentines. And uh, he probably could be seen to be responsible for what I see as a very important change in, in her artistic uh, approach. She becomes much more literary uh, as a result of her close relationship with Michelangelo Bonarotti Jr. And she begins to paint the world through the eyes of a poet. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, star system of composers and music, musical talents and poets and playwrights that she uh, uh, was able to mingle with as a result of Michelangelo Bonarotti Jr. also led to the previously mentioned episode where she appeared on a Florentine stage and sang, dressed as a gypsy. I disagree with Letizia, um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's up for grabs. I think that this painting represents not a gypsy, but a, 
a noble woman at the Ottoman courts, uh, a court lady um, in um, Constantinople. And there is a play actually from the very next year, from 1616, I think, in which the noblemen of the Medici court cross-dressed as noble women of the Ottoman court, and each one of them, dressed as an Ottoman woman, walked up to the Grand Duke, who was sitting in the audience, played a doleful, melancholic song on a lute, and sang, and this was, of course, riotous fun for the Medici court, who had organized this play for a very eminent visitor at the time from Lebanon. The emir of Lebanon was at the Medici court for two years while Artemisia was there. Uh, Fakar al-Din, uh, Fakar Dino, as he was called, he was there with his daughter and his cortege of wives uh, and many, many servants from Constantinople. Of course, when Artemisia was in Florence, she met not just uh, these uh, musicians and talented um, men, uh, but also talented women. She met Galileo, for example, uh, when she was in Florence. She most likely would have been introduced to a female court artist who was a late, um, uh, of close to the ladies-in-waiting of the Grand Duchess, Arcangela Palladini, whose self-portrait is uh, represented here just about uh, a year or two before her early death. She also probably had a chance to meet a child prodigy, uh, Giovanna Garzoni, who came to the Medici court when she was in her early teens, and this is a self-portrait by Giovanna Garzoni. She also would have had a chance, more likely than not, to see paintings by Chinese women artists that were circling around the Medici court and which were described in the very same manuscript that I showed you earlier with her early biography. So in sum, I just would say of Florence that uh, its many marvels left a deep mark on Artemisia but also her marvelous paintings left a very deep uh, mark on the city of Florence. Thank you. And I think, again, here there is a sort of a thread that continues among these different um, talks. And because I think Jesse, in his book, in his beautiful book of 2015, really attracted the attention on the theme of Artemisia's reputation, on her network of, of admirers within literary circles, so in some way how fame, reputation was built up through uh, the contacts with uh, writers and poets. And he also attracted uh, the attention on one important and still quite mysterious moment of her career, perhaps the, the black hole, in some way, still of Artemisia's career. This moment when she's in Venice in the late 1620s. And, uh, and, and so it, there is a fascinating chapter in Jesse's book about this Venetian moment. But the emergence, in some way, in 2019, of a painting depicting Lucretia, which was the painting that we recently acquired here at the Getty Museum, in some way has added a new dimension, Jesse, you know, to your reconsideration of this important segment of her career. And, and we know that there are also disagreements. Uh, Sheila doesn't think that the painting is from this period, so you can see that there is still a lot to to, you know, to, to understand about Artemisia's career. But, uh, Jesse, can you tell a little bit us more about the new, this new discovery and, in some way, your opinion about its place within Artemisia's artistic trajectory in this Venetian moment? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I, it's a little daunting, I have to say, to speak after all these very polished and articulate answers uh, by the three people ahead of me. So I'm worried mine's going to feel a bit like 
warmed over leftovers, but um, let's, um, but basically for me, my introduction to Artemisia, making a full circle here, was actually from um, the exhibition that, that Judy and Keith Christensen curated. Um, I saw it at the Met a few times in 2001, um, where I first saw this painting, which is in the Met, uh, in person. And as Davide hinted at, it seemed to me like there was a curious gap in the artist's career from about 1626 to around 1629 to 30. I mean, four years is, is a fairly significant point uh, when the artist is really at the height of her career. Um, she, it now is clear that she was in Venice for these years, and literary evidence at least suggests that she was extremely famous in Venice. Um, there are a trove of about at least a dozen or more poems written by the sort of elite uh, literary circles within Venice, praising Artemisia, praising her work. Um, they mention her father once in passing, but she is really the star. And strangely, um, she has more written about her than any other artist in Venice of the 17th century. Um, so for me, it was something of a puzzle as to how she could have been so famous, but we also had exactly zero works um, placed in this period. Um, so for me, it was kind of a puzzle to start looking at works that were generally thought to be from, say, the late 1620s or when she was in Rome, or on the other side, the early 1630s uh, when she was in Naples, and to consider um, what connection they might have to uh, what she might have painted in Venice. Uh, so for me, um, I, I wasn't the first to suggest this work might be Venetian, was doing a close look at this painting um, of Queen Esther between her king, between the king Ahasuerus. Um, uh, it portrays an apocryphal story in which uh, the king is on his throne. Um, Esther comes in to warn him that there's a plot against the Jews even though she's his wife, she's not allowed to enter the throne room uh, without his permission. Um, she's been fasting, and she's terrified, so when she enters the throne room, she faints. And here she's shown uh, being supported by her maidservants. Uh, supposedly, King Ahasuerus is going to lift um, his scepter to say that she's been... Um, it's acceptable that she's entered the room, um, but there's no scepter represented here, um, which is odd. He also seems to be quite young, dressed as a dandy, um, wearing especially these white leather boots trimmed with fur and jewels on them. Um, she seems to, in fact, be poking fun at him a little bit. And this would really be consistent with um, the literary culture of Venice, which often had these somewhat body retelling of uh, mythological or uh, biblical stories. Um, the picture is not in good condition, um, especially the figure of Esther has been abraded quite badly, um, but it suggests that the artist and other artists in Venice were looking in particular at a work by Veronese. Um, so 17th century Venice was not the artistic capital that uh, it had been in the 16th century. Artists who came to Venice came really to study the works of Titian, Veronese, Tintoretto, the great 17th century masters. Um, so here, like our other artists, um, I think we can quite clearly see Artemisia looking at Veronese. In particular, um, he has several versions of Esther before Ahasuerus. Um, on the left, we can see this group of Esther fainting with the two maidservants on either side. His king is quite majestic and terrifying, as he's supposed to be. Um, she's also borrowed at some elements like the checkered floor, um, but it's reduced uh, to fewer figures. Um, there were more figures. Um, there was a portrayal of an African servant restraining a dog. You can almost see it. Um, if you're in front of the 
painting in person uh, when the light is in um, the right angle. Um, so it would have resembled, actually, the Veronese even more. One interesting work to think about is this painting on the right by an artist called Padovanino. He is not a greatly admired artist today. Um, and last time I was at the Academia in Venice, they couldn't even find his works in storage. Um, <laughs> but uh, he seems to have been part of the same sort of literary and artistic circles um, of Artemisia. He also seems to have riffed on this Veronese in a way that's quite similar to what Artemisia did. Uh, the king looks quite ridiculous. Um, if I had details, I could show you his, his very silly hat with pearls on it. Um, the same group of the three of the two maidservants and Esther fainting. Here, there seems to be some sort of body sexual jokes. Um, his, the direction in which his scepter is pointing is a little phallic, and we have it mimicked by um, uh, the little person on the left holding also a, a scepter. Um, the other reason um, I see this as, so, excuse me. So this brings us to, to the Lucretia, um, a work that hasn't yet received a lot of study. It was newly discovered and, and newly acquired, as you know. Uh, for me, I see a lot of reasons to uh, link it to Artemisia's Venetian period. Um, first of all is that the face of Lucretia is almost identical to that of the Esther, um, though the body does differ in some ways, as Letizia showed with Artemisia's self-portraits, that she would often begin with a prime drawing or painting, um, adapt it somewhat. Um, what I think in this case that she actually began with um, the head of the Esther um, in the Met. And x-rays can be helpful for this sort of thing. Um, this is an x-ray of the Lucretia right here in the Getty. Um, what you can just barely see is uh, what looks to me like the um, outline of closed eyes. Um, and that as she adjusted the composition, she moved the eyes up, um, made them uh, looking upward. But the mouth, the chin, the throat, the nose all line up quite perfectly. So what it suggests to me is that she actually began with an Esther, um, and as she did with many of those self-portraits, the St. Catharines and so on, um, adapted it into a painting of Lucretia, something completely independent. Um, there's lots of other reasons in terms of approach, the sort of painterliness, um, the use of pearls, the kind of green velvet, um, that, to me, suggests an awareness of Venetian artists, um, particularly artists like Veronese and Titian of the 16th century. But there were also painters in 17th century Venice, um, Domenico Fetti, um, who was from Rome but spent some time in Venice, Johann Lys, um, a German painter, or maybe Austrian. I hope I don't offend any Austrians here. Um, uh, who painted with this kind of lavish, exuberant drapery and were in Venice um, about a year before Artemisia. Um, so one interesting thing is that of these many poems that I mentioned that were written in Venice, several were actually to a famous painting of Lucretia by Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, we don't know if it was this painting, but they're at least very interesting to read in that it's the first uh, kind of literary response we have to how contemporaries saw her work. And while today we tend to think about these in terms of autobiography, in terms about of the artist's kind of personal relationship to the subject, uh, the poems themselves treat it rather differently. Um, sometimes they're kind of alarming from a modern perspective, um, they use elaborate wordplay and witticisms uh, to praise the artist, but they say, for example, you brought Lucretia to life. Um, in some ways, they say Artemisia is responsible for killing Lucretia again and again because she's painted it 
so beautifully that it's as if she's killing herself in perpetuity. She, they even talk about the artist as a kind of co-conspirator in the death of Lucretia, um, which again is, is quite disturbing from our point of view, but shows, at least I think we can say, a real admiration for the artist's talent at creating these vivid images um, and then, of course, their own kind of wordplay and witticism, you know, as the paintings are presented to a public who can admire them and um, praise the artist in, in complex ways. Um, so there's an awful lot of more work to be done. Um, the nice thing about, or maybe the um, frustrating thing about scholarship, depending on your, your um, point of view, uh, is uh, I mean, there's, there's a huge number of opinions, and um, just as these works uh, were painted to create a response, conversation, um, we today here can, can also um, take part in that conversation that's gone over 400 years about this remarkable artist and her works. We may leave this maybe, or maybe go to the next, which is a oh, sort sure. of a... <laughs> Our, um, there are some very interesting questions that I can see here in, uh, on our Q&A. Um, we may start with some of these questions, and, but obviously you are very welcome <coughs> to you know, raise your hand, come down to the aisle, and go to the mic and ask a question. I, I think we may, we may want to see um, Letizia, perhaps, who should be still there, probably, if we can, because I think the first kind of two questions, they are in some way related, Letizia, and they are a little bit for you, I think. And one is, is the reason for the self-portraits the fact that as a woman painter, she did not have the access or opportunity as her male colleagues? And a little bit related, she's, someone is here asking if the loot painting in Hartford and then St. Catherine in London have been cleaned. So maybe you can answer to both these questions. Sure. Um, so in answer to the first question, I think there is certainly a sort of twofold answer. Um, I think Artemisia uses her own features out of convenience. As I said before, you know, though she became a member of the Artists Academy in Florence, she wouldn't have had access to life drawing classes. So she would have had to pay to have models. And we know that was expensive. And this is really, these are the formative years in her career. Um, and as Sheila spoke about her money, you know, she was using her dowry to pay for certain things, but she certainly would have um, painted herself out of convenience. But there is a clear sort of stratagem though as well. And I think, you know, it is an act of sort of self-promotion um, that by putting herself in her pictures, she is disseminating her image through her art and getting herself known alongside and with her paintings. Um, in terms of conservation, um, the self-portrait as a lute player was bought by the Wadsworth Athenaeum um, relatively recently, actually. It was at auction at Christie's, I think, in New York. Um, I don't believe they've done any conservation since they acquired it, but it, it was certainly conserved um, in the last sort of 20 years. It first appeared at auction in the late 90s, very, very dirty. Um, and in terms of the National Gallery self-portrait, we, we bought the picture very dirty, uh, with no frame. Um, and so it was very odd, you know, normally when a museum acquires a painting, it normally goes on show. You know, you announce its acquisition and people are able to come and see it. But we had the painting in conservation for a number of months. And so we decided actually to do, uh, to sort of pilot um, these very short films about the conservation treatment. And you can see these still on our website. We put them out in almost real time. They're sort of five minute films every fortnight on social media, they went out. 
Um, and now you can see them as a sort of video library um, through our website. But they really show every stage of the conservation treatment. And one of the best videos is the, the when the picture was relined and the old lining was removed, because even curators in museums often don't get to see that process. Um, and then there's a very fun one where we're discussing lots of framing options with our head of framing. So I would encourage um, whoever asked the question, anyone else, to, to, to go to our website and have a look at those. Great. Thank you very much. Is there any question from the audience here? Can I, can I add a bit yes, to absolutely. Letizia's yeah, yeah. first answer about uh, Artemisia's access to models mm -hmm. and life drawing? Uh, one very crucial source for knowing what sort of access she would have had to models and the practice of drawing from life is the 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 um, uh, the rape trial testimonies? Mm -hmm. We know from that that there was a certain male model who worked for both Artemisia and her father. So already as a teenager, she is paying money, or her father is paying money. Uh, for her to draw after a professional male model. We also know from those testimonies that she was drawing uh, Tutsia, I think is the name of her governess. Yeah. Uh, Tutsia. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So she, as a teenager, before leaving her father's house, is painting after both male models and female models, and children, the children of um, Tutsia. When she goes to Florence, uh, she's paying many people to work in her studio, and I don't see why she wouldn't have been able to continue paying for models if she wanted to. I also know that she had a, uh, a sister-in-law who was unmarried and orphaned, uh, who remained very close to Artemisia even after she split up with her husband. And I think that that sister-in-law might have been the mm -hmm. body for some of these images. Uh, later in life, of course, she writes explicitly about paying female models. I would like to make the point that just because Artemisia's facial features appear on an image of a woman who is nude or half-dressed, shouldn't make us think that that whole body is Artemisia's. She could s s surely pay a model to be in front of her for the body and then add her own features to the face. Um, it's very awkward to paint in the nude, especially in a cold climate like, <laughs> like um, Florence in the winter. And I don't think that Artemisia had a mirror in front of her nude body and painted at the same time. It's an absurd situation. Male artists didn't do that when painting male nudes, so why should we think that Artemisia did it when painting female nudes? And can I add, I mean, there has been, not as much more recently, but this idea that whatever Artemisia wrote in her letters is absolutely God's you know, truth. I mean, she's strategic. And yeah. I've always felt that comment about the models. Yes, they might have been expensive, but I think she's negotiating. Yeah. She's trying to get paid, and she's trying to get hired. So mm -hmm. we don't really know what that yeah. meant, that she yeah. said that models were so I, expensive. I do agree. When, when she writes to Ruffo that she has to do these multi-figure paintings and need different models, so she will be spending a lot of money for models, she's always marketing because she wanted more money from Ruffo. So it's, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I have two questions more general. I think maybe Judy can answer. Someone is asking if there are other works by Artemisia which are not paintings, such as sketches or engravings. Such a generally interesting question. And also a related one, was there a period of time when she was more in demand? Maybe when she was, I don't know, more successful? I don't know if we can answer to this. Mm. Well, the first about drawings is a huge issue for both Gentileschi's. Um, uh, so 
um, in the, there was a show in 2016 in Rome where they introduced a drawing that was purported to be by Artemisia. I know there have been some drawings to come up at Sotheby's that have had some support. Um, but, you know, as um, Jesse has sort of suggested in comparing the faces on the um, Esther and the Lucrezia and others, and uh, we know Orazio did tracings. So, Probably they did draw. I mean, she did draw, even though, of course, we always say Caravaggio did not draw. Um, he incised. Well, artists who drew incised, so we don't know. Um, so, you know, when you look at any artist, you're looking at the tip of an iceberg and you just don't know what's missing. And so um, it could be that her drawing style is something we've not recognized. Um, but uh, right now, I, I don't, you all might know better, I don't think there's any universally accepted drawing by Artemisia's hand. But we do know that she, she did draw in that she references, for example, yeah. later in Naples, right. that um, a drawing of hers had been used for a painting by someone else, and she was angry about that. And I know Sheila has done some work on this and possibly identified some drawings, though, um, Universal acceptance is, is a hard thing in this <laughs> discipline. <so. laughs> it is, it is. So we're not there yet. So, and then the other question about when, uh, if there was a moment when she was more in demand, like uh, yeah. mm. in, in her career, in the, in oh, her in her career. career, during her life, I think the person was man. Well, yeah, yeah, I think they. Um, I you know I well again Naples is I mean Venice as a whole. <laughs> Naples is coming, is emerging, but it's still, there's so much we don't know that, and probably a lot buried in some very uh, disorganized and, archives. And we may, we may say that she lived in Naples basically from 1630 until the end of her life. So except with the trip that she did to London in 37, 38. Uh, so she lived a long portion of her life in Naples. Right. So it's so hard. I mean, I still, what we know, I'm, it, it does seem like she wanted to leave Naples and she wasn't successful, but it, again, it's based on spotty evidence. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, certainly she was feted in Rome. I mean, she was feted in Florence. I mean, yeah. uh, demand. But again, we don't know how many paintings were missing, so we don't know kind of how much, how well commissioned she was. I think there are couple of interesting questions, maybe, I think maybe Sheila is very well equipped to answer to this question about the financial freedom. So how common is someone asking, was the financial freedom that Artemisia seemed to enjoy at that time in Europe? And so it's a more general question about financial autonomy of, you know, women and especially women artists and someone is also asking why she didn't need she if she was financially autonomous she needed to marry so I don't yeah I think maybe you can say something about this aspect of finance Artemisia and her finances I should point out that Artemisia's financial situation is very anomalous so what we read about women of this time period suggests the opposite, that women could not legally sign contracts, be responsible for debts. Um, but in fact, many women were in practice the heads of a family business if, for example, uh, they were the only adult in the family, they would have to take control of a family business. And so there were many uh, situations that allowed a woman to bypass the law I've just m mentioned a second ago, um, in which case a woman's name had no contractual efficacy on uh, in the court of law. So there were situations that were typical that allowed a woman to bypass that situation. She would just use what was called a mondualdo, uh, which was a kind of like a notary public, a man who would sign the contract for her and a fee would be paid and that was it. It was just a matter of bypassing a general law. Um, another um, situation regards Artemisia's 
Florentine period, uh, the, the marriage contract itself is full of stipulations, and it is a contract that does not follow the standard conventional model, which is why no one found it in the archives before I did, because it was kept in a, in a section of the contracts and wills that were uh, stipulated with specific conditions, and they are each uh, unique. Her uh, contract allowed her to control her dowry in a lot of ways. And uh, her husband must have agreed to separate from her, and we don't know what private convention they worked out between the two of them, but the, the Academy of Artists with its court and the merchant's court both recognized Artemisia as an independent person in their courtroom representing herself by the year 1616. So I, there is no law on the books to explain how this was possible, but her society allowed it to happen. Hmm. Thank you. Um, you are just shy or come, come, <laughs> come, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Then there is another question here, which is interesting. We may respond. But... Thank you. This has been really wonderful. Um, you mentioned somebody mentioned children. Um, I don't know about her children. <laughs> How many did she have? Did any of them become artists? I think maybe Pila again. Yeah. <laughs> we we have either birth records or burial records for five children, including some probably stillborn, in a period of the seven years in Florence. Uh, it's not clear how many of her, how many children reached adulthood in the end. Um, there's some confusion in the documents, but it, she at least had one surviving daughter, possibly a second one born after Florence, but at least one surviving daughter. And um, uh, yeah. what was the rest of the question? It was about the children, yeah. Did them become artists? Hmm. Uh, she, we know the daughter was... Do you want to say something about this, Jesse? Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I mean, we, we know that one was trained to paint. I don't know whether her... Um, she ever made much of a career of it. I mean, there's... Uh, later letters where Artemisia is complaining about the cost of, of a dowry for her daughter to get married. There's also a letter of an English visitor to Naples who said that Artemisia's daughter played the spinet for them um, to entertain. So um, it seemed to be a very kind of, from the way he described it, she said she lived in great splendor in Naples. The daughter played the spinet. Um, it seemed like a very... Mm -hmm. um, sophisticated household, but I don't think we have any evidence of any works by the daughter or mm -hmm. any sense of whether she even continued painting mm -hmm. beyond her marriage. Thank you. And she, the daughter had the same name of her mother, no? Prudencia, mm -hmm. and one son that lived a couple of years, I think Cristofano, was named after a, a painter in Florence, Cristofano Lori, who was a very good friend of Artemisia, and there is a very beautiful letter that she writes to her lover, Maringi, where she mourns, uh, and she says that she's in terrible distress for the death uh, of this uh, two-year-old son, Cristofano, so it's a very moving letter. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a question which I think here is, is very interesting, and is, how would you characterize Artemisia's later work and reconcile it with her earlier work? So clearly this question comes from someone who knows a little bit that Artemisia, we have not to think to a monolithic, we don't have to a monolithic idea of the style of a painter in, in every period, I think, but in the 17th century too. And there is uh, an incredible evolution in some way in Artemisia's uh, style. And so maybe, Jess, you can say a little bit about this sort of 
you know, in, in a few words, but the, the important transition in some way, something happens at some point from the sort of early Caravagist um, phase to a different way of approaching paint uh, and subjects. Yeah. So as Judy hinted at in her comments, uh, you know, the artist's later works in particular were, were not appreciated. And this is still, I think, a problem. Um, her earliest works are with their strong naturalism, these strong lights and darks are so immediate, so appealing that we feel the real presence of the artist there. Um, but more broadly in Europe, this style of painting went mostly out of fashion by the 1620s. And I think part of what we have to understand with, we've been talking about Artemisia as a strategic artist, as someone who kind of develops, adapts, is that by the 1630s, 1640s, that would have been seen as, as a very old fashioned style. We can also see her moves to places like Venice, um, to Naples, visiting England, as places that she sees you know, this very rich visual culture, contributes to those as well, but um, the ideals have really changed and she's presenting herself as a successful kind of pan European painter. Um, she's painting the style, these multi-figure kind of polished, sometimes erotic works that don't fit really our notion of what she should be painting, but that's exactly what uh, people wanted at the time. Great. I think we can have a final question, or oh, two final questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about her trip to London. <laughs> Maybe the person so, who is in London <laughs> <laughs> can answer. <laughs> Letizia. Yeah, we're all very curious about her trip to London, unfortunately. We know very little about her trip to London. Um, we don't even know exactly when she arrived. We don't know why she came. Um, it was thought at one point that she, she came because her father called her. Orazio had been court painter in London since 1626, working for Charles I and Henrietta Maria. Um, but Sheila's also proposed... I think very convincingly that actually it was more a sort of diplomatic mission. But she's in London probably for a, a couple of years. And we know from the inventories of the Royal Collection that she painted quite a few works whilst she was in London. And the only one um, that today is sort of universally recognized and accepted is, the, is that allegory of painting, which I showed in my slides. We know she also sent a picture to London before she came. Um, we know the king had been trying to get Artemisia to London from her letters. I mean, she's partly using it as a bargaining tool with other rulers, saying, you know, the king of England wants me to go to London. But um, we do know that she sent a painting of Tarquin and Lucretia to London um, some years before she physically arrived. Um, but we really don't know very much. And... Um, Many think that she may have had a hand in the big ceiling decoration. It was Orazio's last great commission for Henrietta Maria. He died shortly after completing it. And there does seem to be a distinction in some of the figures. It does seem that it could be the work of two hands, but there's absolutely no documentary evidence that she even had a hand in it. So actually that's a real area that needs, needs a lot more research, a lot more work, um, as well as Naples. I think you know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty sweet, but we don't, we know nothing. <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to thank you first for um, sharing your intelligence and your background and your experience with us. It's been really marvelous to have uh, mentorship of art appreciation so close at hand. Um, this is regarding the painting that I saw flashed on the screen. I think it was called the Magdalene's... Um, the, the Magdalene's uh, yes. repentance. Yes. And it, it, it begs the question of, I had in my mind about whether or not Artemisia named her own paintings. Because I found my experience of that painting very, very different to what she might have named it. So did she name her own paintings or was that done after the fact? I mean, we don't think she named that one. That's what we call it. Um, oh, okay. <clears throat> I mean, it was a sort of standard subject, but again, there can be nuances. Um, are there ones 
I mean, you'll see in the literature, if you were to look at um, either go through catalogs of museums or catalogs of exhibitions, the titles vary widely. So most of them don't have absolute standard um, accepted titles. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, it was a great pleasure. And, and, and thank you, Letizia, for staying so late for you. Thank you very much. Right, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.